U.S., did you know, makes up almost 40% of the defense budget of the entire world. Think about that. 40% of the budgets of the entire world. In fact, you would have to take the next seven most powerful military countries in the entire world, add up all of their budgets to equal what the United States spends in one year annually. That's why it's particularly perplexing to hear that the United States needs to once again increase its military budget by $5 billion. The reason, say Pentagon officials, China, just China. But here's the really scary part of all of this. We are learning that top military officials are indicating to Congress that what they really need to do is move U.S. military forces, actual troops, into the islands around the South China Sea to be in, quote, close quarters with China. Here is correspondent Alex Mihailovich with the story. Just months ago, he said it on a visit to India in a not-so-coded language. And as the Indo-Pacific region faces acute trans transnational challenges, such as climate changes and challenges to a free and open regional order, cooperation among like-minded countries is imperative to securing our shared vision for the future. Now, in a much more direct statement, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has made it clear what he believes one of the main challenges to our free and open regional order is. If you haven't guessed it, it's China. Without giving out any specifics, Austin issued an internal directive at the Pentagon, calling for several initiatives to counter China. In a written statement on the directive, Austin said, the initiatives I am putting forward today are nested inside the larger U.S. government approach to China and will help inform the development of the national defense strategy we are working on. The directive is based on the recommendation of a high-level Pentagon task force. China has responded to the directive, saying that it is just another excuse for the U.S. to spend more on the tools of war. Playing the China card has become an excuse for the U.S. to increase its military expenditure and build up military strength. And spend more, it will. Last month, the Biden administration's defense budget called for the shifting of billions in spending to deter China. More than $5 billion will be spent on the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which plans to modernize U.S. military assets in China's region by funding radars, satellites, and missile systems. China insists, while the U.S. points a finger at the country, that it isn't the problem, but rather the issue is the attitude of the United States. Some people in the U.S. stick to the Cold War and zero-sum mentality. When it comes to building national defense capabilities, they always talked about the so-called challenges from China. In reality, China does have a formidable military, but its spending on defense pales in comparison to the U.S. In 2020, the United States spent more than three times more than China on its military. That's just under 40 percent of total military spending around the whole entire globe. Even though China says it's not a threat, Defense Secretary Austin has indicated to Congress that he is interested in moving more U.S. military assets closer to China. However, some in the U.S. government feel that such aggressive maneuvering will put Americans in danger, with China being capable of striking hard and fast in its neighborhood if it's pushed over the edge. The United States already has more than 70,000 troops in Japan and South Korea and many say plans to further encircle China are simply making matters worse. For RT, I'm Alex Mihailovic. When the only constant in life is change, you need to be ready. This is the Man Made Survival Show. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Jose Prado, Man Made Survival. Thank you so much for coming back to the channel and watching this video. I really do appreciate it because today's video is going to be something that we have to talk about which is something that we have not talked about in a while now. And as you saw at the beginning of this video, it's going to be about China and the potential war we're going to have with them eventually. All right. And a lot of information has come out about what's provoking the war and what's actually being said, you know, the, the, um, the threats that are being made on both sides and everything that is going to be gearing us towards going that direction. All right. So as you heard at the beginning of this video, it shows how much the United States is really spending on, on, on war. Or actually, you know, in the military. That's not even a war. But we already spent over $6 trillion being in the Middle East for the past, you know, since 2003 until now. 
And have we actually achieved anything? Some people may say no, some say maybe a little bit, but the point is that we already wasted a lot of money. And if we're gonna go into a war with Russia and China that we're provoking ourselves because of the use of the SWIFT system, the US dollar, you know, uh, threats that we're doing, being over there, you know, just doing several things that is actually gonna push China over the edge and Russia too. Are we really gonna be able to afford to go into that direction? Now you see why I keep talking about the economy this, this past few videos, because if we are setting ourselves up to a time where we are really broke, you know, we can't really do anything and we start cutting off the social safety nets of the American people to direct that money somewhere else, if the government is not, you know, not even defaulting in their in their debt. But what I'm saying is that if we're going to be so broke that we can no longer f afford to fund the military, what are we going to do with that war? How are we going to raise the money necessary for us to fight effectively? And more than likely, we're not going to where at least the government or the, the uh, military industrial complex is going to have to do something about it before, before we actually do fall. So... It's something that we have to look here, you know, in the next few years and months and everything, because even though we don't have a clear day when we could actually go to war, um, the possibility is there for the next, you know, several months to several years within a decade. OK, so the first thing that I have for you is something that is been working for a while, something that has been happening for a while. But, you know, just the rhetoric is what's really important here, because eventually the words are going to stop and the fits are gonna start flying, okay? This article comes from Zero Hedge and the first headline is insult to injury. Beijing furious over US senators entering Taiwan on military plane. In the latest show of your support for Taiwan, a group of US senators flew to the island on a military aircraft on Sunday, a trip that drew sharp condemnation from Beijing. On Tuesday, China denounced the visit, quote, the US senators visited Taiwan by military plane using the Taiwan issue to engage in a political show challenging the one China principle and tying and trying to achieve the so-called goal of using Taiwan to control China, end quote, the Chinese defense minister said. Chinese-based analysts told the South China Morning Post that the increased U.S. support for Taiwan makes China taking military action to, the, to take the island more likely. The U.S. officially maintains a policy of strategic ambiguity concerning Taiwan and a possible Chinese invasion, but there are growing calls among China hawks in Washington for the U.S. to adopt the policy of, quote, a strategic clarity, end quote, that would mean the U.S. would commit to going to war for Taiwan if Beijing moved to take the island. The policy changes or well, the policy change in itself would be a major provocation towards China and make com conflict more likely. All right, so the reason that I started this podcast with this headline is a very simple. Uh, it's very simple. <clears throat> we are, well, okay, so China is, is saying, right, that they don't mean to be a harm to the U.S., that, you know, they don't really plan for any type of war or anything like that. But when we do something like Taiwan, then China will double down and say, you're doing this, you're provoking us, we're going to go to war against you. So which one is it? Are they docile to where they don't really want to do anything? They're just talking crap? Or are they really going to do something about it and they're going to try to blindside us? Well, we don't know. But we have to look at the one that is more probable that they are probably going to do something about it. You know, And the reason we have to look at that one is because it's the one that's more devastating. You know, if you talk a lot of crap and you're not going to do anything, then what's really going to be the difference? You know, there isn't any. But if you're talking a lot of crap and you're going to do something about it, I better pay attention and get prepared for it. Because then when you start swinging, I have to not only block your punches, but swing back. Right. So that is the reason why we have to look at this the small provocations that could turn into a war. Now, uh, China, China has always been in their own country, in the position where they can tell people what to do. And if they don't do it, they either kill them, they put them in concentration camps or hard labor, hard labor camps or prison, okay? And when they go outside their border, they know they can't do that, especially not against the United States. So they become very frustrated, right? Because their authority is challenged. So they're working really hard to make sure that that day, the day comes where they can tell the United States what to do and we'll do it because we have no other choice. 
All right, so um, now they're talking about the possibility of China taking Taiwan being more likely now that the United States wants to have some type of, um, what would you say, policy that would guarantee that if China tries to take over Taiwan, we will go to war. And I really do believe that one of the reasons is because what we have seen with the semiconductor chips, you know, it has been a very big problem that Taiwan has been doing or has been having that is affecting the entire world, especially the United States. So if we, if Taiwan is the number one producer of the semiconductors and China takes it over, then who's going to get the revenue? China, right? And the United States doesn't want to do that because, you know, we already depend on China so much. You know, we, we depend on them for pharmaceuticals, for labor, for trade, for a bunch of other things. And if you want to add, you know, manufacturing the chips for computers and everything else, then that's just going to be another Achilles heel where they're going to, where China is going to have a hand over us. So that is the reason why we have to pay attention to this and, and see what the United States is going to do, you know, and obviously the government don't want, don't want to let that happen. And, you know, there has been a lot of talk that, that Joe Biden is, uh, it's, um, a puppet for Beijing and whether or not he is obviously the, the war machine don't think so, right? We were itching for a war with them, but it's not happening. Or at least that's the illusion that they're giving us. But the point is that we cannot get sucked into the political rhetoric uh, saying that, that Biden is, it's, uh, you know, it's owned by China. We have to look at the things that are going to happen. Because, again, it doesn't really matter if, um, <laughs> it doesn't really matter whether or not Biden is going to be or is controlled by China if the if the war machine will go to war against them, you know, because they can just overthrow Biden, you know, with a military coup, they take over and then they go to war. That could be a possibility. Would it happen? We never know. But my point is that if it gets to that position, it would happen. Now, the next headline that I have for you is from Zero Hedge, and the title of it is Paranoid Delusion. Beijing urgence halt to U.S. sweeping 250 billion anti-China tech bill. After the U.S. Senate on Tuesday passed a historic bill to commit some $250 billion to fund, to fund scientific research as well as subsidies for chip makers and robot developers, including an overhaul in the National Science Foundation, the largest effort to, to date in an effort to boost a U.S. competitive edge over China as a tech powerhouse, Beijing has reacted by mocking Washington's paranoid delusion and Cold War mentality. It is also calling for the immediate halt to the legislation process as it goes to the House. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer hailed it as, quote, the moment where the Senate lays the foundation for another century of American leadership, end quote. In Tuesday night statements from Senate floor Tuesday, well, I guess they messed up on that, a $52 billion emergency allotted to the Commerce Department to bolster domestic semiconductor development and manufacturing is considered the centerpiece of the bill. On Wednesday, China's foreign ministry urged Washington to stop treating Beijing as imaginary enemy <laughs> when they know they're a real one, while alleging Senate leaders' rationale ultimately constitute a smear on Chinese achievements that and that it interferes in China's international affairs under the banner of innovation and competition. The a statement claimed that China ultimately seeks to develop a win-win relationship with the U.S. on the global stage. And a statement from China's National People's Congress Foreign Affairs Committee appeared to take direct aim at Biden and Schumer's statements. Quote, the bill shows that the paranoid delusion of egoism has distorted the original intent of innovation and competition. End quote. It said according to Xin Huan. The statement strongly urged the U.S. House to immediately stop the legislation's progress, lest bilateral ties be further damaged to the point severing cooperation in key sectors. All right. So, again, this is the 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 incoherent way that China is looking at this. All right. First, they're mocking the United States, saying that it's you know, silly that, they were, that we're doing this. But then in the same sentence, they're telling them to stop it, you know, it's silly, but stop it. You know, we don't want to mess with it. We don't want to deal with you trying to take over the next century. So you better stop right now because otherwise you're going to 
you know, piss us off and we're going to stop uh, cooperating with you for whatever it is, right? Whatever they want to find some type of leverage. So now, now that we have this idea that China is pretty much threatening the United States not to help Taiwan, not to do any type of step that would actually, the United States would protect Taiwan from China, but they're also saying that we better not have any type of legislation that is going to compete against China. Okay, so because of those two factors, it really makes China, again, flex its muscle. And since they are frustrated that they cannot make the U.S. government do what it wants, then it's going to try to threaten it in any way they can. And, you know, eventually it could get to the point where they, they do do something about it. Right. For example, Taiwan, they may not want to do anything about it right now, but they might do later, which that is the biggest problem that we will be facing. Right. So. My point is, we have to look at this rhetoric that has been happening for a while now. But the only difference between then and now is that China is a lot more advanced. And maybe the rhetoric is not going to take it anywhere right now, but later in the future it might. Because, you know, China is, is preparing itself to become more military power. Yeah, is that the right way to say it? To be more powerful militarily than than the united states is and you know i've i've shown you here the the um what the pentagon has done with their um what you call it with the um with the simulations with uh with the studies that they've done they do believe that 2030 china will defeat us in a war and they're saying that they could probably do it now but the point is that china may wait you know, they might be talking everything that they're saying right now, but they might wait just a little bit longer to get that, that piece of military technology where they actually feel confident that they will defeat the United States. And we might create a, a World War II scenario where, you know, China becomes the more powerful army that's out there and the allies are going to have to come together and defeat China because, you know, China will be advancing and they would take, be taking all this territory possibly maybe even doing genocide on, on a certain population. So the, the, the United States and NATO, they will really have to, to understand that the economic policies that are in place right now will eventually affect us in the military later. So I've said this before, China could just wait for the, U, for the U.S. economy to collapse completely before they attack. Because if we don't have any more money to feed the machine and create all these um, of these weapons, then that is going to be just a cakewalk for them, right? I mean, that's what I would think. I would wait for my enemy to be in the worst possible position that they're able or that they're in for me to be able to do my my move where I feel that I'm stronger, where I have you know better uh, better money, better technology, better everything, and then I'm gonna go in there and it's gonna be. Um, you know, a cakewalk. So that's what I'm thinking China is thinking also. But the next thing that I have for you really shows that Taiwan and this bill that was passed that is going to challenge China, you know, with AI and, and all the other things that talked in the article, it's really making them look and getting, the, getting them angry. All right. So this from the sun and the title is War of Words. China threatens U.S. with intense nuclear showdown as it ramps up atomic program as a vital deterrence against America. China has threatened the United States with an intense nuclear showdown as it ramps up its atomic program. The Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece newspaper launched a blistering attack on the West saying China's nuclear plan was now vital to the country's strategic deterrence against the United States. Hu Xinjin, the editor of the Global Times, said, quote, the number the number of China's nuclear warheads must reach the quantity that makes U.S. elites shiver, end quote. U.S. hostility towards China is burning. We must use our strength and consequences that Washington cannot afford to bear it, to bear if it takes risky moves to keep them sober. It comes after U.S. President Joe Biden's approval of extra weapons being shipped to Australia in preparation for a potential clash. Chinese President Xi Jinping said that he wants the country's military to be on par with the U.S. within the decade and to have overtaken its rubble by 2049. 
the 100th anniversary of the communist regime. All right, so the last part of the video is the most important one because then the shows, right, the the um, the ambition that the Chinese military has uh, right now that is aiming for. They want to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the United States, you know, by the, um, by 2030, within the decade. So in the next nine years, they want to be able, if we were to go to war against them, they want to be able to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. By 2049, they're planning, right, to be able to overtake us, probably as easy as it could be. So let's just say that we have no war whatsoever against China or anybody else for the next 19 years. What we have to do is that we have to get prepared for sure. We have all this time to prepare. We will have 19 years. But what we would have to do is we would have to get, or at least the government would have to get itself in a position where it would bring down the debt. It would bring down... Um, all this spending that we're doing, you know, on all these extra things, you know, we got to stop helping other countries because the, the help is eventually going to stop. You know, if the U.S. economy collapses to where we cannot help anybody else and the government can even help itself, all this other help that's out there is, is going to end eventually. So, you know, that's going to even give, now that I think about it, it's going to give China even more leverage over, over everybody else. Everybody else is going to be looking for that relief that they used to get from the United States. But anyways, aside from that, if we don't go to war in the next months, in the next several years, but we do go to war in the next decade or, in, or by 2049, then you're going to have all the time to have your preps in place, to have, uh, you know, multiple locations. You're going to be able to have or should be able to have a, a bunker that's strong enough to withstand any type of bombing, you know, to be able to have all these things in place. So if we don't go to war for the next 19 years, no, wait, well, I'm thinking, no, 19, yeah, 31, 41, oh, my bad, 29 years. I was doing the math in my, the math in my head wrong. For the next 29 years, you know, you have 30 years to prepare then even if nothing happens in your lifetime, this is where the whole generational thing comes in play. Because right now, if, you're, if your parents or your grandparents were not preppers, but you are, you're going to have another 30 years to be able to buy the land, to be able to have everything in place the way that I've taught you here. And if war breaks out for your, for your children, your grandchildren, then they're going to be able to have all these things in place where we are going to be able to be a lot stronger as a community of preppers than we would be otherwise. And hopefully by then, you know, in the next 30 years, I really do hope that this prepper community has grown and all the things that I have planned for it do come forward, which is only going to strengthen the country to the individual level, right? So I really do hope that we have that much longer to prepare and make this um, prepper community something that has never been before and this actually going to be... Um, honor and respect it. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next headline, which this is from the Epoch Times. And this one goes hand in hand with what you read or what I read a minute ago. All right, so the same person is making this point uh, in this article, or I think it was two different articles where these two different agencies picked it up and then, you know, they went along with it and they wrote their own articles. So this is going to be the second part of, of the first one, which goes with this. All right, um... Top Chinese mouthpiece suggests country prepare for nuclear war with U.S. as Wuhan lab leaks theory gains momentum. That's from theplace.com. Hu Xinjin, a top Chinese propagandist, declared recently in China, that China should prepare for a nuclear showdown with the United States after President Joe Biden affirmed continuing investigations to the origin of COVID-19 pandemic. The Chinese propagandist, who edits the Beijing Control Global, Times newspaper respond, responded to Biden's statements by saying China must prepare for a high intensity showdown after citing China's nuclear armament. The, com the comments are particularly eyebrow rising because he, he claims to speak for government officials who cannot speak publicly. In fact, Hugh explained in 2016 that he pals around with Chinese government officials and admitted, quote, they can't speak willfully, but I can, end quote, a suggestion that he broadcast the sentiment of the communist officials. Okay, so this is the second part of that. 
we have um, we have this person who claims he speaks for the Chinese government, right? That we should we should be punished for daring for one to help Taiwan, two to do this bill that is going to really make the uh, competition more severe. You know, or at least that's what I'm hoping it does. And now with the uh, with the uh, or origin of COVID nineteen. For this person, those are, you know, mortal sins because they're, we are challenging China. So he's saying that there should be a nuclear showdown because of it. So if that is the, the, the way that they think, let's say that that is the actual way that the Chinese officials think, everybody in the government, right, in the ruling class. If that's exactly how they feel right now, when they can potentially be beaten in a nuclear showdown, so what's it going to look like when they actually have the upper hand? When they actually do have the nuclear weapons, they actually do have, um, you know, a greater military or whatever in the next coming years. If that's how they feel now, when they can be defeated, how are they going to feel later? That's the real question. So that is the reason why we have to prepare right now. We have to take care. We have to look at everything that we're seeing and, and prepare for it. Okay. And now the final, the f um, no, that's not the final. I have one more headline and then a final headline. Which really this is showing how China is positioning itself right now to when it does have the upper hand, it's going to have a smoother transition into, or not a smoother transition, but rather, um, I guess waging the war is going to be a little bit easier. This is from the Epoch Times and it says, Chinese wind farm project in Texas is a threat to national security, says Kyle Bass. A proposed China wind farm in Texas Poses national security concerns, warned China watcher and hedge fund manager Cal Bass. The proposed wind farm site is about 30 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border and near the Longlin Air Force Base and U.S. Air Force largest pilot training facility. The land for the wind farm is owned by a Chinese company called GH American Investment Group, which has since 2015 bought 130,000 acres of land. An area the size of Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Val Verde County. The man behind the firm is Sun Guangjin, a businessman from the northwest Xinjiang region in China who has strong ties to the communist regime. Quote, my view is that the reason that he bought the wind farm and wants to put up 700 foot turbines is he plugs directly into our electric grid. Well, plugging directly into our power grid is something that should never happen. Bass founder and chief investment officer of Heyman Capital Management told Epoch TV's America's Thought Leader program. Spurred by these security concerns, the Texas legislature recently unanimously passed legislation that would ban individuals or companies connected with China, Iran, North Korea, or Russia from entering into con contracts Relating to the state's critical infrastructure, the bill has sent has been sent to the governor for signature. If it is signed, it will take effect immediately, which, of course, that's great news, because if this is something that is um, a strategy from China, cutting those ties or, you know, not making it possible would be the best thing to do. And, and Texas has taken the proactive measure to actually, you know, not allow any company that are that are pretty much. I guess you could say, in cahoots with these countries to enter a power grid, which, you know, for us, it makes sense that that would happen. But for people who do not understand cybersecurity or EMPs or the lack of the power grid, you know, would not really understand. But good for the uh, for the Texas government for taking practice steps to not let that happen. But that shows how China is moving into making sure that they're in the upper hand if a war was to break out. Because if they are plugged into a grid, they have full access to it, then they can knock it down, especially the Texas power grid, if they want to invade the United States through Texas. All right, this is one of the things that I've talked about here in the past, which is a plausible thing that could happen. Because as we know, China has been developing the Belt and Road Initiative. It has done it all throughout the Middle East and Africa and other places, but it has also done it in South America. So one of the one of the things that could happen if these countries do get into the contract with China 
is that if they default on that debt, China would automatically take whatever it is that they built. And they focus mainly on ports and, some, and you know, roads that will connect other places strategically. But the point is that if China has access to ports in South America, it's going to make it a lot easier to, to sell the ships there, to unload, to, you know, put weapons together, put soldiers there and go up into the United States from the south southern border. And if Texas grid gets taken down at a time where China would, um, you know, coordinate an invasion force, um, then taking out the grid would be the best thing to do because then people would be disoriented. There wouldn't be any news broadcasted. And whatever attack that China would try to do would actually catch everybody by surprise, especially the government. So for, for, for Texas to actually take the step is actually really, really important. So, of course, kudos to them. Now, the final healing that I have for you today is, is important because, you know, it shows how things are, are also are escalating with, with um, Russia. And after I read that headline, I want to get into the preparedness, which, of course, is something that I've taught you here um, on a consistent basis, but also want to touch on other things. Uh, the last headline is from the ronpaulinstitute.org and it says the coming Biden Putin train wreck summit. It's going to be a rough 10 days for President Biden, just as news breaks that under the Obama Biden administration, the U.S. was routinely and illegally spying on its European allies. He is preparing to meet with those same allies first at the G7 summit in England on June 11 through the 13th and then at at the June 14 NATO meeting in Brussels. Make no mistake, Joe Biden is up to his eyeballs in scandal. Ed Snow tweeted last month when news broke that the U.S. teamed up with the Danes to spy on the rest of Europe, that, quote, Biden is well prepared to answer for this when he soon visits Europe since, of course, he was deeply involved in this scandal the first time around, end quote. Though Germany's Merkel and France Macron have been loyal U.S. lapdogs, the revelation of how Washington treats its allies has put them in the rare position of having to criticize Washington. Outrageous and unacceptable are how they responded to the news. Russia has been routinely accused without evidence of malign conduct and interference in the internal U.S. affairs. But it turns out that the country actually doing the spying and meddling was the U.S. all along and against its own allies. All right, so what, what you can get out of this article is that there is a possibility that once our economy collapses or it gets to a severe inflation to where everybody's fleeing from it <clears throat> and they run to China, our allies are not going to help us out at all. Because if this is, this is something that has been happening, you know, spying on our own allies, it shouldn't really have um, surprised them, you know. But now that they are, they're the ones being watched, instead of them doing the watching, is what they don't like. So now they understand how the rest of their population feels. But the point is, if our allies abandon us at the very last minute when we need them the most, because our economy has collapsed, we have actually you know, spending all this money on the on the uh, military that we can no longer use, and we have an active invasion or attack of the United States and our allies don't help us, then we're going to be in a world of hurt, and we have to make sure that we prepare for that day. All right, so we, we have to look at our preparedness in a way that is going to, is going to set us up for the rest of our lives. Especially if the country gets threatened to a level where another country can come in and actually occupy it and maybe even change its flag and government. If there is ever a, I guess you could say, a threat of that happening, it would be now or, you know, in the next 10, 10 to 15 years. And the reason that is is because we are declining morally as a nation. And you can, you know, you can speculate on how that is. But it depends on, on where on that um, social structure you, you, you're at. You're going to either see progress or you're going to see, you know, destruction. So it all depends on that. But really, if the United States is so, so concerned 
in putting down revolutions in, within the United States because of the of the man of the money that has lost all its purchasing power. We no longer have the goods that we need because of the shortages due to the farmers not being able to afford the the uh, the gas that they're going to need for their tractors, or maybe the drought has made it so horrible that since it's going to last for 1,200 years, you know, it forces all of those people to move to different parts of the country, maybe even the world. If the United States is on that on that um, trajectory, then our preparedness has to be something that's going to outlast all of this. And we have to look into, into making sure that the United States government can take care of us, but doing so by taking care of the population. I really do believe that if the things that I want to do with these community of preppers do come to pass, you know, through your support and everything, if they do happen, you will see that we're going to be better off. Because if we do have 30 years before we have a major war breakout, or we have at least another 10 to 15 years before a major economic collapse happens, if we have all that time, then we're going to have, you know, the opportunity to to really educate the population, especially with things um, getting worse with the rhetoric between China and the United States, between the United States and its allies, you know, uh, with internal affairs that is happening in the United States. So our preparedness really has to go beyond. Um, it has to go beyond what we can stock up. We have to stop thinking on what can we produce. We have to stop thinking what can we consume and shift it to what can we produce. Because the production of goods and services is going to be a lot more important than, than just trying to survive. We're at a part in history where we can actually set, set ourselves up to where we can create a movement that can turn into a nation of its own. And I'm not talking about overturning the U.S. government or anything like that. So don't don't think that I'm saying that. What I mean by we can create a nation of our own is that we start taking care of each other. We start having the same priorities. We start looking at the problems and we're going to be trying to get to the same solutions. And if we have this prepper community all throughout the United States and even globally, then it won't matter where we go to. We're going to be welcome because we're all the same people. And that's exactly what my aim is with all of this. That's what I really do believe. And I really do think that if all of this happens the way that I want it to happen, then we're going to have these endless opportunities and these endless things that, that will um, that will actually better the human race or, you know, at least within the same group of like minded people. And if something horrible happens, then we'll be the refuge to the other people who did not want to prepare, who did trust in the system, who were self-absorbed in social media and all those other things. Because once reality comes and smacks everybody in the face and everybody wakes up, instead of them panicking, they're going to be able to find refuge. And that's exactly what I want to do. So that is the reason why I really do think that when we are looking at the threat of war, world war and nuclear war, that... Um, it really should wake us up to the to the um, to the reality that this time around the destruction will be a lot worse than it was in, two, in World War II, because you know the technology was a lot more uh, limited. the The kind of weapons that they that they have then to where we have now is a completely different era. Okay, it's like we're a thousand years. Um, ahead of what we used to be back in, in World War II. So if, if with the limited technology, there was such destruction, how much more destruction will there be in the future? That is the reason why I believe that if we do this right, if this community of preppers takes the right steps and we all go for the same goals, okay, everything would be better off for everyone else. And it doesn't matter where people go, everybody's going to be um, welcome. And we, everybody's going to know exactly what their role is going to be. They're going to know to what kind of rules they're coming into. And they're going to know exactly what's going to be the contribution for everybody else in the community. All right, so I want to leave you with those thoughts. Um, you know, that's my philosophy. That's, that's what I've been shaping this entire year, year and a half that I've been doing this podcast. And I want to share more things with you, but that's going to have to be later on because, you know, as things progress... 
um, as I mentioned, the the opinions that people held in the past about prepping are not going to pay off. All right. So again, I want to remind you about the store, MemmonSurvivalStore.com. And also want to remind you about the book, uh, Purple Secret Cash. You can get it there for free. All we need your help is with shipping. And also remember that our third book or second book is coming out um, shortly. And when that's available, I will let you know. All right. So I would really appreciate if you can help us out. Uh, help out this work by purchasing the book. So again, my name is Jose Prado, and remember, always ready. The Man Made Survival Show.